Welcome to the first uh, in a series of webinars. Let me just remind you a little bit about what the Great Basin does. Uh, the mission of our LCC is to support landscape scale conservation, promote science and enable science-based management so that human and natural communities can respond and adapt to climate and land use change. And today we have our very first series of, uh, in our webinar series highlighting projects that the LCC has supported. This series might be a little different than the regular series you're thinking of. We've limited our speakers to in the neighborhood of 30 to 40 minutes maximum because we want to have a lot of conversation afterwards about the talks and their relevance to what you're doing or what you think you may need them for. Um, if you have questions, uh, please use the chat box on the right-hand side. If you have a question during the webinar that's about something that is procedural or data related, we'll probably hold that till the end, uh, but we will have plenty of time at the end of the webinar, uh, webinar today for other kinds of questions. So today, I also want to remind you that our next webinar upcoming is July 14th, and that's uh, Owen Bauman from the University of Nevada, Reno, is going to talk about cheatgrass die-offs and opportunities for restoration. So if you're interested in that, July 14th, 1 o'clock Pacific. So today we have jo Dr. John Boone from the Great Basin Bird Observatory. Let me put that to the side here. And I'm going to hand him the keyboard and the mouse. And John is going to talk to us today about evaluating species management guidance and monitoring for the Great Basin, mostly in Nevada. Take it away, John. All right. Thank you, Todd. And hello, everybody online. Um, I am going to be good. Yeah, OK. I'm going to be reviewing our, our project that's entitled, as you see here on the title slide. I'll start out um, with a little bit of the rationale for what we're doing and take you through some of the steps. And depending on how the time is going, then I, I will wrap up with some examples of the kind of outputs and hopefully insights that we will be generating as a result of this project and, and tailor the number of those examples to the available time frame. So to jump right in, page down, there we go, oops, I did two of them, I'm backing up one, okay. Um, pretty much everybody who's on the webinar right now, I'm sure, understands that species-based or species-focused management is, is the predominant paradigm in wildlife management and in biological conservation. Um, it may not be the ideal unit of focus from the pure ecologist perspective, but we all understand that there are many reasons why species management is as predominant as it is and, and understand what those reasons are. And so our goal in this project is not to engage in some sort of broad critique of species management vis-a-vis -vis, uh, ecosystem management, but rather to approach things much more constructively, to, to take it as a given that species management is the reality that is with us and to take the time as a result of this funding to do what the practitioners of species-based management often cannot do, which is to evaluate large sets of information that are relevant to management of particular species, drawn both from um, the agency internal processes and documents, from, from the literature, from sets of monitoring data, to cross-reference all of that in a systematic way, and to then look for opportunities to improve and regularize and make more efficient the practice of species management, again, for our set of focal species, and then to assume, or at least to uh, offer the hypothesis, that the kinds of inefficiencies or the kinds of opportunities for improvement that we see with our focal species might, in fact, be representative of the opportunities that are there for the broader set of species. So that's sort of the overarching um, rationale and, and goal of what we're doing here. Um, just to, 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 to reiterate what we see as some of the potential shortcomings of species-based management, some of which are also shortcomings with regard to any kind of management we would do, but um, with regard, they, they do certainly apply to species-based management, and that is that um, species-based management doesn't always effectively incorporate whatever the best available information is, either because the, the um, managers are not aware of it or the process of incorporating New information is, is got lag times built into it, so that process by which species-based management is continually improved uh, sometimes suffers 
simply because of inertia or lack of time to, to consistently update species-based management guidance. Um, we sometimes see significant variations in guidance for particular species among a set of agencies that share stewardship responsibilities for them, and we were curious to see how often those variations occur, if they're, if they're anomalies or if it's relatively more common. Um, a big thing that we think is important is that you know, we, we understand fully that the quality of information that we have upon which to base species management will vary. In some cases, very good, very solid information. In other cases, it's, it's less good and less solid, um, but it's all that we have. But there isn't a systematic way to tag the basis for management um, according to competence. And I think that's a very valuable thing to, to keep in the forefront of our minds when we make decisions based on, on this information of varying quality. And then finally, um, you know, species goals hopefully can be formulated so that they are minimally compatible with system-wide goals, in other words, goals for a particular habitat type or a particular ecosystem or a particular community. But certainly if species-derived goals are at odds with those or seem to be at odds with those, it's worth pointing out where that occurs and what can potentially be done to rectify that kind of discrepancy where it exists. So I think the genesis of the project that we're working on uh, with, with uh, that I'm talking about today was probably more than anything else the revision of the Nevada Bird Conservation Plan which we undertook at Great Basin Bird Observatory with a number of partners um, four or five years ago. Um, what happened in this plan was that we consolidated a great deal of information about species habitat use, um, conservation status, trends, natural history, and tried to translate that into what seemed to us and to our partners to be the most justifiable and the most supportable set of conservation strategies, either with regard to habitat management or with regard to research planning and monitoring. And there was a very systematic layout by which we presented this information, which is too small to actually read, but you can see that it's regular tables of a, of a certain sort that were in this plan. And what occurred to some of our partners when they had access to this was that it would be useful, at least to some species, to go the extra step, to compare this kind of cross-reference information to what existed within management agencies that provided protocols and guidance and processes for doing species-based management to do exactly what I described earlier, to look for places where um, the existing guidelines, the existing protocols could be improved by, by referencing the broader universe of information that exists. So in particular, a couple of our partners um, suggested that we take advantage of um, um, LCC funding opportunities to, to propose doing exactly this, which we did, and we're lucky enough to be funded. So within our scope of work, and I've hit on this a little bit already, but within our scope of work and within our conception, our goal here was to, uh, well, it really, let me back up a step. Our goal here really is conceptually very, very simple, but rather involved from a procedural standpoint. So it was to systematically consolidate, cross-reference, and evaluate sets of information from lots of different sources that bear in one manner or another either on the actual practice of species-based management or on the potential practice of species-based management, either um, with regard to specific species or with regard to guilds of species that all exist within a particular kind of habitat. And to then use that as the basis for drawing both generalized and species-specific conclusions about where there were opportunities for improvement. And really the improvements are the critical end product of, of, of our undertaking here, the, the critical currency. And so we're, we're trying very hard to frame those in implementable language rather than then focus on sort of an ideal that's impossible to achieve, but rather to look for incremental oppor or opportunities for incremental improvements that are, at least in theory, um, something we could implement with current resources and, 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 and staffing situations and that sort of thing. So we had to first uh, constrain the project to be manageable, and to do that, we, we aimed to identify about 30 either focal species or guilds of species that we were able to um, review and evaluate sort of en suite um, because of their similarities in, in natural history and lifestyle. 
And there were a lot of bases for, for choosing these focal species and gills. Probably the primary one was just how they floated up in terms of their conservation priority, which could be derived from a number of different sources. There are, of course, rankings that are put out by Continental Partners in Flight and Audubon. Um, at the state level, both Endow and Heritage have mechanisms for identifying and or ranking species of conservation issue. All of the major federal management agencies have their own particular lists of sensitive species or species of conservation concern. And of course, then there are various um, more regional or local conservation plans to consult as well. And we did a similar process um, when we did the bird conservation plan, but in this case, we were aiming at a more uh, limited set of species, and we were also limiting our focus to the Great Basin of Nevada rather than all of Nevada. So uh, Mojave-centric species were excluded from this process. And uh, then finally, we are also um, um, looking at uh, what we know about trends of species. Um, species with, a, with what we believe or know to be a negative trend tend to get prioritized. Um, and additionally, we pretty much excluded species that are already the subject of a truly comprehensive type of review. So sage grouse, for instance, which are at the top of everybody's radar screen, are already the subject of a process that, in at least some respects, is similar to what we were trying to do here. So it didn't make sense to repeat that kind of work. So we're really interested in species where there's a conservation concern, but where this type of exhaustive process has not been undertaken. And so uh, the list that we came up with, it is, of course, since we're a bird observatory, mostly birds, but we, by intention, did not want to entirely limit it to birds. You'll see uh, a few groupings of small mammals and herps. And uh, part of the rationale here for the ones that were chosen goes a little bit beyond conservation concern and into where GBBO has pre-existing expertise. I personally worked a lot on small mammals all through my graduate school and postdoc. Um, Elizabeth, who's our executive director, did quite a bit of uh, consulting work on herps in, in Utah and Nevada in the past. So we, we wanted to make our conclusions at least a little bit broader than simply bird-related ones. And so you'll see where we have both a guild listed and a set of species. These were the ones where we did conceptually group species, and although we looked at them individually, we're aiming to draw conclusions at the guild level for these that are guilds, where we simply have a list of what are actually species under the guild column and nothing in the species column. These are species we approached as individual units entire in their entirety rather than trying to group them into guilds. Um, and I think we have pretty much concluded that we've got sufficient information for everything listed here with one or two possible exceptions to carry it through to an end product. So it's possible one or two of these listings might drop out of the final product based on there not being as much to go on as we thought. But for the most part, this is representative of the, of the entities that will be the subject of our, of our final project report and uh, analyses. So uh, we go through a number of different steps to try to get to our final conclusions here. The first one is the most basic where we where we simply gather information from a variety of sources about you know, predominant habitat associations, phenology and seasonality, um, aerial requirements where that information is known. We think this is a pretty much a black hole for a lot of species. Um, so we're, we're focusing on gathering whatever information we have on area requirements um, as a basis for drawing conclusions. Obviously trend information and then as, a, as an organization that spends a lot of time specializing on broad, uh, broad landscape monitoring programs. We take quite a look at what uh, monitoring programs exist for a given species or guild and assess in a variety of ways whether we think that's a relatively decent monitoring program or a, a poor one or a sufficient one. So the basic information is the easiest to gather. Um, these columns that I show here are only a partial set of what we consider the basic information attributes for a given species or guild, but it gives you a taste of what they are. Uh, going beyond the gathering of basic information, we look at the sets of data or analyses that are drawn either from research efforts or from ongoing monitoring programs. The illustrative map that you see up here in the right-hand corner um, summarizes all of these little red dots or places where the Nevada Bird Count program, which is a program of the Great Basin Bird Observatory, has 
gathered um, standardized bird monitoring information at one time or another. The yellow, bigger yellow dots are where we gathered data in 2014. For those of you who are curious, uh, the 2014 site selection is obviously not a entirely random or random stratified scatter. In some years, we have more versus less funding for true statewide coverage. And in this particular year, most of our Nevada bird count funding was project-based. So we get, a, we get a bias in coverage, a distinct one in 2014. But if you look at the program as a whole, it's actually pretty good randomized statewide coverage. So that's one set of monitoring data that we consult, obviously, since we have it. But we go beyond that to the breeding bird survey and various other monitoring programs that may occur at something less than, than the statewide level or be more intermittent. And then with regard to research findings, that's obviously primarily um, a process of scouring literature. Um, we had a few areas of particular concentration in our, in our research review. Uh, a particular note is the impact of disturbance on primarily on birds, but on anything we could get our hands on that was relevant to this project. There's really a hunger in the agencies for better data, better information, better standards with regard to um, uh, minimizing disturbance impacts, but the information that currently exists is very, very haphazard or spotty, um, not regularized, collected under a variety of different research protocols. And so by cross-referencing all of this, we're, we're attempting to, to put it into a more tractable um, framework. And so a, a lot of our time spent reviewing research findings was focused on disturbance impacts. Um, then another type of step was to dig deeper into the issue of monitoring and not only determine whether in a vague sense the monitoring was there or not and whether it was poor or not, but to truly evaluate it in terms of um, what are now fairly, fairly well codified um, sets of standards for good monitoring design and good, good sampling design and good monitoring protocols. So all you see here um, is illustrations or a couple of, of well-respected um, monitoring and survey design references that lots of people refer to and sort of a schematic of the standard avian point count along a transect. So we're digging a little bit deeper into all the monitoring programs that we know about to basically create a, a tabular summary of where they're strong and where they're weak with regard to things like um, protocol, uh, sampling, sampling design, um, spatial coverage, temporal frequency, all of these sorts of things. And then really, in many respects, the most difficult step is to dig into internal agency documents with regard to uh, protocols for gathering information, with regard to the guidance that is then generated from the information gathered. And probably the biggest stretch is with regard to the process that's undertaken um, to try to translate information into actions or decisions. Again, our goal here is really not to critique agency process, but where process may be the major sticking point in achieving better species management to at least be in a position to point out where those bottlenecks um, occur. And they, they may occur with regard to interagency communication or coordination, where we have different sorts of protocols or different sorts of guidance for a given species. Um, they may occur with regard to the relative infrequency by which standards and protocols get updated. And certainly, there is no process, as far as we know, by which a sort of a confidence ranking is attached to the information that's the basis for the conclusions that are drawn. And uh, the little inset here is just a, it sort of illustrates that these documents are, for the most part, very internal, oftentimes in draft form, oftentimes works in progress. Um, and there's lots of sort of legacy issues and, and examples of sort of regional office inertia and how these things are implemented. So. This, is, this has been the most, uh, required the greatest um, proportion of our time, I think, and is the part that still, we've got just a little ways to go before we think we're done with that. The kind of outcomes for our report that we would like to generate, um, I've basically alluded to them already, but to, to list for everybody's, um, to list and to justify for everybody's use where we see in, inconsistencies within species management or gills inconsistencies primarily between agencies that share responsibility, or we see inconsistencies with species management standards versus the sort of reasonable standards that would be attached to the systems within which these species occur. I'm going to have one particular example of that here toward the end. 
where we think there's really an opportunity to update protocols and guidelines based on newer information than has currently been wrapped into them, um, to identify where there are critical information gaps and monitoring gaps, particularly those that could be filled with a, with a modest effort or a modest, um, a modest uh, devotion of resources to them. Uh, again, I talked about kind of proposing a way to rank um, competency and adequacy of information so to, to give recommendations, if necessary, for how we can better translate good information into actual standardized actions. Um, sometimes there's a little bit of a, of a nebulous link there between those two. And again, to wrap all this up in a sort of a realistic framework for where opportunities exist for improvement rather than just identifying everything that's potentially wrong with the system as it is. So um, that brings us to about 20 minutes in. And so for about 15 minutes, I want to go through some examples of the kinds of findings that will be presented in a more exhaustive fashion in our final product. I'm going to primarily concentrate on examples where the information basis for species management is not up to date or not adequate and where it could be potentially improved. Um, the examples uh, derive from issues of agency protocol or agency guidance or agency process, we're we not quite to the point where uh, we want to draw our final conclusions from those. There's still a few pieces of the puzzle to click into place. So I'll primarily focus on information-based examples. Now those of you on the, I'm sure among those of you on the webinar, there are a, a decent set of you that have heard Great Basin Bird Observatory talk about one of our favorite species in the entire state, which are pinion jays, and so I'm going to briefly reiterate some of that in a more of a context um, specific to this project. For those of you who don't know, there's a fairly good west-wide and Great Basin data set derived from the Reading Bird Survey on these birds. Um, not a great one if you look at any particular subset of that timeline, but over time it's uh, generated a, a fairly high confidence downward trend of the shape that you see right here, which is a quite significant one, especially in decades leading up to 2000, that downward trend appears to be uh, reducing in slope as we move into the present day. Um, but that translates over this time span into something like a 4% annual decline, which is in many cases more than sufficient to get a species very high on the conservation radar screen. In the case of pinion jays, that really hasn't entirely happened yet for a variety of reasons. But certainly the basis for conservation concern um, that this species is present. And in addition, if you look more toward the guild level, um, the trend with pinion jays seems to be echoed in a more muted fashion for at least one or two other pinion juniper associated songbirds that you can characterize as year-round residents and as birds that are primarily granivores or omnivores. Interestingly enough, these, these, these seeming downward trends do not are not echoed for other pinion juniper songbirds that are, are neotropical migrants and which are primarily insectivores. And it's, it's kind of a curious biological puzzle to figure out exactly what the, what the systematic differences are, and we have some theories on that. But in short, um, we do see something going on with this type of bird guild, we think. And uh, as a consequence of seeing those trends and, and some of our own monitoring data, we have uh, undertaken some focused research on, on pinion jays over the past several years, a species that had been almost almost entirely unstudied except in northern Arizona, which were really in many ways atypical flocks because they were very human situated. So in short, what we seem to be finding based on telemetry data, based on nest studies, based on lots of observational data is that, that the simplified assumption that this is a bird that's associated in a very general way with pinion juniper woodlands needs to be very much um, um, made more specific in that these birds are, spend the great majority of their time in what we would characterize as either edge or transitional woodland areas, including places like this that are much more sagebrush than actual pinion juniper. And that even extends to some extent to where they choose to, to create their nesting colonies here. Obviously, they want some cover for nesting, but they choose areas with cover that are relatively close to the edge, and they seem to avoid, as best we can tell, like the plague, the dense interiors of large pinion juniper patches. So this is this is a case where the kind of the paradigm based on incomplete information needs to be 
very much refined um, based on some, 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 some better information. And interestingly, of course, when we talk about the pinion juniper sagebrush interface, the driving force behind how that's managed these days is the sage grouse. And these kinds of areas uh, tend to be the kinds of areas that are selectively targeted for habitat treatments to restore sagebrush. And in the most um, extreme case, you end up with these very sharp edges between restored sagebrush habitat and dense interior, what were formerly interiors of, of pinion juniper woodland that, of, that are, of course, getting more and more senescent and more and more mature based on the trends that we all know about with pinion juniper woodlands across the West. So we're, of course, not suggesting that there's anything wrong with managing for sage grouse, or nor are we even arguing that restoring um, uh, by pinion juniper removal is a bad strategy, but certainly there's an opportunity to better rectify the kinds of areas where this is done with the, the value of retaining sort of these feathered habitat edges, not only for pinion jays, but for a variety of species that are either more versus less pinion juniper or sagebrush associated. So there are ways to do this that we specifically have recommended and will we'll recommend in this, this output to, uh, to, to better make species management guidelines coincide with one another in a sort of a system framework. So the pinion juniper songbirds are an example of where the existing species management paradigm is, is, has been affected by poor knowledge of species biology, by insufficient monitoring, where we see a manifestation of the requirements of two different species, at least initially appearing to be contrary to one another, when in fact there's actually an opportunity to rectify them, I think. And furthermore, an example of where even as new information becomes available, the, the existing paradigm has a certain sort of inertia, and there's always a challenge in how to best uh, incrementally improve that without having anything that's important grind to a halt. So there's lots of ways in which we think pinion junipers are an interesting example of in, in this project. Sagebrush songbirds, the Guild of Sagebrush songbirds, are primarily a good example of where protocol issues could potentially be improved, what's typically done to comply with the Migratory uh, Bird Treaty Act for these birds is to do clearance surveys in advance of habitat disturbance and then to establish nest buffers if, if nests are discovered. We actually see a lot of ways in which this particular protocol for achieving species management could potentially be improved um, without throwing a monkey wrench into the works and while actually improving, we think, compliance with the intent of MBTA. The problems that exist with nest clearance surveys, as anybody who's a bird specialist knows, is that the degree to which nests of different species can be successfully detected and found in a, in a quick protocol varies tremendously by observer, it varies tremendously by species, and we suspect that in many cases where clearance surveys are done with the intent of discovering nests, it's simply got such a low detectability rate that it's, it's not a it's not an efficient way of actually trying to, to protect birds that are protected under this federal legislation from disturbance. Um, furthermore, the nest buffers that are established around discovered nests are, in many cases, either, well, they're essentially arbitrary because the information on which those buffers are based is, in many cases, so, so poor and so incomplete. Um, the process is based on a very generalized approach to nesting phenology when, in fact, for different for species, for different species, in different latitudes, in different years, the phenology can vary significantly. So the, the, the right timing for nest clearance surveys, if you're even doing that, needs to be better adjusted for biological realities. And of course, we you can all imagine sort of the incentives that are built into a process that's based on discovering nests and its potential for disturbing a, a, a you know, a, a kind of a development project of some sort. So there's lots of recommendations that we think are workable to make with regard to that example. Um, coming just past 1.30, I'm going to try to wrap it up in five minutes, so I may end up glossing over one or two of the remaining examples. But Swainson talks a great example of where inadequate knowledge has created a paradigm. These birds have been presented in lots of management plans as being in Nevada primarily associated with agricultural areas. They obviously nest in larger trees, but you know those trees have been tied to the presence of irrigated alfalfa fields and some of the prey that exists there. When in fact, the more 
work that's been done with this bird, especially in the last two or three years, the more we're discovering that it nests quite possibly in much larger densities than we imagined in in or near pinion juniper woodland patches and in, in, in larger pinion juniper trees. So as that information comes in, there's going to be a reform, need to be a reformulation of some basic natural history information to incorporate this population segment that's not agriculturally associated. These three kinds of birds, owls, hummingbirds, and night jars, are all cases where our basis for drawing conclusions about their trends or even their habitat associations is very much incomplete, largely because they all require specialized monitoring protocols that haven't been implemented on any kind of large systematic scale. Um, at best, we have uh, inter local um, and temporally intermittent knowledge about their distribution patterns, but if we are ever going to take seriously getting really good management guidelines for some of these birds or even understanding what their trends are, there's going to be need to be some effort to, to gather more systematic information on them. Um, brewing owls are an interesting example. If you if you they figure highly in lots of different conservation plans and conservation initiatives, but you are hard pressed to get a a really coherent picture of what their populations are doing on a regional basis, partly because those conclusions are drawn from these partial sets of information that vary from area to area. So we don't even know for sure whether these birds should be higher on the conservation radar screen or lower on the radar conservation radar screen. And it's simply a, um, a reflection of, of the fact that the information that we have is so poor for some of these birds. Golden eagles, and both a, both a cautionary and an encouraging example, um, there were, the species has grown quite a lot on, on the conservation priority list as a result of renewable energy development. Um, when we really looked at the information we had to go on, starting several years ago, there were some problems with it. The monitoring system was very spatially um, intermittent. Um, it was very nest-centric when, in fact, of course, these birds build many times more nests than they actually use in a given year, so it was hard to translate that information into into you know more meaningful um, information about territories. Um, we, to this day, don't understand very well the extent to which tree nesting plays an important role in the distribution of these birds in Nevada. But the good news is that as a result of being so high on the radar screen, um, Fish and Wildlife Service both um, primarily sort of in a, in a westwide enterprise has spearheaded an effort to do exactly the kind of thing we're trying to, to encourage for a broader range of species by creating more uniformity in survey protocols and the translation of information into guidelines, into information about disturbance buffers, and into prioritization of gathering new information where it's really needed. So um, we are covering golden eagles in this, in this project, but they are really an example of something going in the right direction, I think, in terms of information that's already happened without, <laughs> without benefit of our particular insight in this project. I'll mention very briefly small mammals because I worked on them and ha have an interest in them, but the, suffice it to say that compared to birds, it's much more difficult with small mammals to gather um, wide area distribution information and translate that into information on population size, on trends, and on habitat associations. And at best right now, we, the information that we can use to generate species-specific guidance is inadequate. Um, just as a very quick example, the critter that you see pictured right here, the sagebrush vole, is um, in almost every description of its habitat use described as using arid shrublands, which is correct. But as, as a result of working on a, a very different project, I found a big healthy population of them in the late 90s, smack on the top of of Mount Grant at uh, 11 or 12,000 feet, whatever the height there is, which is really outside the realm of their habitat uses it was currently understood. So there's a lot to learn about small mammals that could be that could be learned if a more systematic monitoring program um, for sp specific species was ever put into place. So um, the kinds of generalities that we hope to be able to offer useful insights on again have to do with information, all the things listed here, the area requirements, disturbance impacts, on and on down the line. 
line, excuse me, um, some generalities about how we can improve monitoring coverage, hopefully just by tweaking existing programs and protocols and perhaps targeting some additional resources if they become available in a, in a well-considered way, um, to point out where it's truly important where the process seems to be um, the primary impediment to getting good information into implementation. Again, it's not our place to pass any kind of final judgment or draw any kind of final conclusions about agency process, but there are, I think, a few points at which um, it, by highlighting where the process could potentially be improved, we could, we could also improve species management um, in, a, in, a pretty, in a pretty immediate way. And then finally, to put, try to put it all into the context of the systems and the habitats that are really the most functional biological units that we would ideally be um, tying everything to if circumstances allowed. So with that, I think I'm just about at the target time frame. I would like to acknowledge the Great Basin LCC for, for funding this work and for giving us a little bit of latitude in the timing because we had a few things happen last year that, that slowed us down. And um, also there are a number of agency partners who have not, well, not contributed directly to this project, contributed in a, in a collaborative sense and also funded some of the work that we've done and others have done that have generated the information that we're using and bringing to this particular project. So with that, I'll wrap up and Todd, I think we'll MC the discussion from here on out. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh -oh. So I want to check here to see if Liz, did we have any questions submitted online? We have one that has popped up so far, and that is a question about is there any monitoring of herps, frogs, um, toads, snakes, etc.? The short answer is not, not it's, it's all the monitoring that's done is done in relation to specific habitat conservation plans, which have obviously areas of interest attached to them and sometimes time frames attached to them. Um, and then, of course, to, to research projects and to, to more localized sorts of focuses. I mean, the best example I know of of a more systematic effort to monitor herbs has actually occurred in Utah, so it's not immediately applicable here. But um, the short answer is, is no, neither with small, we're not aware of any small mammal or herp monitoring programs that really meet the standard for being broad area and, and spatially um, extensive um, for dealing with sampling and uh, stratification issues and for being frequent enough to be of use. It's all, it's all essentially sporadic. And of course, Indel, you know, has its own internal efforts to gather this sort of information, but in practice what happens is that it, it occurs at the times and at the places where circumstances allow it to happen, and it's not driven by, it's not truly driven by a, by a conceptualized sampling plan or monitoring plan. Thanks. Okay, and it appears there's a follow-up question to that one. Go ahead. Um, asking about large carnivores and any monitoring that's happening with them? The, there were no large carnivores that were on our focal species list, so we can't claim to have done any sort of exhaustive effort with regard to those. Um, I, that said, I'm not aware of anything that meets what we consider the kind of standard that we would apply, that, you know, that we aspire to in the Nevada bird count. That said, um, there, there may be something that approximates that. Um, I, 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 I don't have a good answer for you. Maybe somebody else, maybe somebody else does. But they're not a, not a focal species on our focal species list, so we have not done the done the review process. Thanks, Liz. Do we have any questions from the phone lines? There is another one that just came through, okay. and that is, what is the impact of mining claim markers, um, the open PVC pipes, on bird populations? That's a, that's a good question. Um, it's obviously an issue of concern, and, and by the way, not only with mine markers, but with certain other kinds of infrastructure that have the same impact on birds. 
all of the information that's been gathered on that um, has been opportunistic. Well, mo at least most of the information has been opportunistic. Um, there have been Endel uh, uh, district biologists who have taken a special interest in this and a few others in the agencies. And so the you could conceivably extrapolate that information into some sort of impact metric within the areas where they've worked. It, that hasn't been looked at um, systematically across the broader landscape, and there really is not a clearinghouse, if you will, where people can contribute the information that they opportunistically gather into a sort of a holding pen where over time it might accrue into something that could be looked at in that manner. So it's a little bit past anecdotal information, but uh, not a whole lot past anecdotal information right now, except in a few specific areas and for a few very specific applications. And there was one um, follow-up on to that, which someone wanted to point out, that Indow is actively removing mine claim markers with some of its partners. Right. And then... And I would... I would, I would hope and presume that, that what's found in those is being systematically recorded. Um, I don't know that for a fact at this point. It's kind of on the follow-up list to try to find that out, um, both not just with regard to this project, but just with regard to the mission of Great Basin Bird Observatory in general. Um, but I, I, I don't have immediate knowledge right now of whether or not uh, people are going out in the field specifically to do that or simply doing that when their other duties and obligations bring them into contact with these markers. I, I suspect it's a little bit more of the latter than the former, but it, I, you know, it, it may be, we may be pleasantly surprised to learn that it's more of a, more of an active process. Um, yes. Um, yeah, so um, in your talk, um, you noted this trend towards um, increasing, I guess I'd call it specificity in habitat, that moving from just, say, sagebrush to, oh, it's on the border or of war specific habitat type. And I was wondering then that correspondingly you'd think down the road um, for highlighting priority conservation areas, you'd need a map of that more specific habitat type. And I was wondering if you've looked at all the correlation between what's out there which in some areas of the Great Basin is pretty coarse, mm -hmm. <laughs> what the habitat is. That's really an excellent question. One thing I glossed over in the interest of time is that for some of these species that are considered conservation priority species, it's not only a matter of refining our knowledge of the kinds of habitat they like, but even being able to quantify what constitutes high quality versus low quality habitat within that, within that umbrella. Um, for some birds, that's very well understood, but that's that's not uniformly the case. And so, um, that's been you know that's a big focus right now. For instance, of the the golden eagle work that's being done is trying to better quantify and better model what constitutes good habitat for golden eagles in various regions. Um, everybody understands that to some extent it's a combination of appropriate nesting substrates, perhaps appropriate disturbance profiles or absence of disturbance profiles, but beyond that, that it's somehow tied to issues of, of you know, hunting opportunities, prey availability, prey density. Um, but beyond that, um, not only is the, the specific formula fuzzy, but it probably varies regionally, and even beyond that, we're a long way from being able to map that in a reasonable way. So it's not only putting boundaries around the habitat types, but aiming towards the circumstance in which we can put boundaries around uh, habitat that, that has particular quality attributes, as we better understand that. Um, another example is the, the common four wheel, which people kind of have a sense, perhaps should be on the conservation radar screen, but uh, all anybody really knows is that they're out there in sagebrush, but I don't think there's any good information on what constitutes higher quality habitat for that species versus lower quality habitat, or even whether they're sen particularly sensitive to habitat quality issues. So um, that's a very good point that um, our sometimes our mapping ability lags behind our understanding of habitat use, sometimes vice versa, or sometimes they both can stand 
significant improvement. Thanks, John. Liz, any other questions coming in? There are a few questions and a few kind of follow-up comments that we've received about the markers. Um, a couple of people have pointed out um, that all information is recorded as to the mortalities in markers and uh, when it is provided, and that there are a couple specific projects documenting all of these mortalities. Um, someone also pointed to a database that's maintained by Endow um, when some of these bird remains are found. And um, there was another comment about that we now, there's now a survey protocol through CBD, um, Mike Wilson, to survey for night jars nationwide, and it needs some more participation in the survey. Right. Exactly, yes, there is definitely, the protocol definitely exists, and, and uh, we're aware of that, but um, it's not broadly implemented in our region, which is where the, you know, where the process falls down. But yes, the, the solution there would be very much a kind of a breeding bird survey sort of model where we get that protocol implemented across a reasonable sample of sites within our area of interest. John, I have a question. Um, one of the things you're doing in, the, in this analysis is looking at data reliability or ranking it. And I'm curious um, about how you do that. How do you make a decision whether something is reliable, somewhat reliable, or unreliable? We can't pretend that that's completely objective, and that's why it's only ranked basically as one of those three things as opposed to something that's more misleadingly quantitative. Um, but, you know, reliable data comes from, the components of it are that for the area for which conclusions are being drawn, the information is being derived from representative areas within that region rather than just subsets of them. So we have lots of cases where we basically extend knowledge that's actually local knowledge to a broader area based on the absence of any more appropriate set of information for doing so. Oftentimes it's critical that um, to be truly reliable that the monitoring data is comes in regularly and um, is part of a systematic program. Um, so for trend information, that's what's truly critical. I mean, if trend information is based on you know, point, data from points in time that are, that are very intermittent, very widely spaced, and where sampling within each point leaves a lot of room for error, you know, that's, they're, they're, that's, that's less reliable. So for some specific things, like for trends, we, we basically follow a pattern somewhat similar to what BBS does as best we can to determine what's reliable, what's not. For, uh, conclusions for, for guidelines about um, how to implement information or for disturbance buffers. It's a matter of, of reading papers and determining whether it's a robust set of data that conclusions were drawn from or a more limited one. So the honest to God truth is that in, at the end of the day, there's a lot of subjectivity in assessing that, but we think that we put enough thought and time into it that most biologists would most of the time put a attribute on data reliability or, or guidance reliability in the same of one of those three categories that we're using. Um, it's the process, the, the admittedly subjective process is written out at, at some length for different kinds of attributes in the, in the draft plan, but uh, there's honestly no way to, to, to make that just mechanistic. It, it requires some, some judgment. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Any questions from the folks here in the room? Yeah, um, just a bit of a follow-up on that subject as well. Um, I believe you mentioned in your uh, assessment reports that um, not just your own um, quality assurance, quality control efforts, but kind of a meta-analysis of other quality analysis and control. And I was wondering if you could kind of briefly go over your findings from what other institutions are doing in that same realm that Todd was just talking about with data quality. The, the only example that I'm really aware of that is based on broad, regional, or even beyond data is the one that's done in association with the Breeding Bird Survey, which is a fairly statistically sophisticated approach by which they attach their reliability rankings to trend information or population size estimates and that sort of thing. Um, we can't and don't try to recreate that, but we try to take that as guidance 
in terms of how to, to structure the process where data are sufficient to do so. Um, I'm not honestly aware of anything comparable to that at that sort of scale in terms of trying to assess data reliability. We're, we're trying to just make the case that even thinking about it and attaching a informed but ultimately subjective marker to data serves if nothing else. So for instance, if, if, we, if we put those flags on it in one of three categories and somebody's pulling that information just out of nowhere, if that information carries through the whole process, it will be criticized, rightly so, and the discussion will ensue about whether the data really are good or bad. So simply the starting the process of, of, of roughly trying to, to rank data reliability, data quality, guidance reliability, data quality, will have sort of a, a synergistic effect on, on uh, having that discussed where it needs to be discussed and where it's controversial. And I think probably an 80% of the cases where we'd attach a marker to a piece of information, it wouldn't raise flags because it's so patently obvious that the, the information is either non-existent or it's being used far in excess of what its true, you know, yeah. extensibility is, or that it's, you know, a big, robust program, or that it's somewhere in between. But there will be cases where different people have a different take on it. So the best way to get that consensus is to start actually making the call and then having, you know, evolution proceed, if you will. Right. Yeah, that's fantastic. I guess um, for me, I come from the uh, spatial data world, and there's an interesting parallel trend there in attaching uncertainty layers, or if you create a model, um, creating the map model, and then an attached like, kind of coefficient of variation map mm -hmm. on top of that, and mm -hmm. kind of an interesting parallel that this isn't just happening um, kind of in the avian and species modeling world, but right. kind of has a broader groundswell. Well, before we finish up, I should probably talk to you about the state of the art in that and uh, make sure that we're at least having an appropriate nod to that sort of thing. I mean, I think it's about where you're at, but yeah. it's just starting. So, Liz, we have questions uh, that people have typed in. We don't want to dominate the conversation here. Yeah, I have one question, or actually two questions for you here. The first one is, um, how about some birds with aversion to pinyon juniper habitats encroaching into sagebrush? and the negative association with pinyon juniper encroachment, and the examples I listed were sage thrasher, brewer sparrow, sagebrush sparrow. Right, I mean, great example of where if you're, you're hopefully aiming sort of in a philosophical way with whatever you do on the landscape to do the most good to the most species, all being weighted by the species that need the help the most, if that makes sense. And uh, sometimes, we, sometimes there might be incongruities in that formula that are very difficult, but we think, I mean, our take on it is that uh, there's no lack, there's actually no lack of places on the landscape that are pinion juniper encroached that are of little biological value that would be a far greater value if they were reclaimed as sagebrush. Um, and some of those areas exist in relatively convenient spots on the landscape too. Um, so our basic suggestion in a nutshell is that when habitat treatment projects are envisioned and where there's any latitude in where they are, to factor in the kind of woodland that's being removed to reclaim sagebrush, to not just lump it all together as pinyon juniper woodland, but to say, hey, you know, if we're going to reclaim a thousand acres of sagebrush and we're going to take that out of some part of the footprint of pinyon juniper woodland, there's parts of the pinyon juniper woodland that are far less valuable for some species like pinyon jays than other parts. And to the extent possible, why not aim as a, as a general priority to take it out of those parts of the pinyon juniper footprint rather than the parts that are the potentially the most valuable. I think there was one other question, Liz. Yeah, the other question, this is a really easy one. It was just um, asking uh, John if you would be willing to share any of your slides Yes, absolutely. They're, they're, as far as I'm concerned, they're shared already. So, so whatever that means, Todd can send them out or I can send them out, whatever the case may be. Yeah, just to remind folks on the phone, uh, this webinar is being recorded, so it will be posted on the Great Basin LCC website, www.greatbasinlcc.org. Uh, so you can get them there or you can email me or John directly and we'll get you a copy of the presentations.
And if we have no other questions, I think we'll uh, we'll finish up. Just a word from your sponsor, the Great Basin. Thanks you for sitting in on this conversation today. Um, we're interested in your feedback on this format. We've shortened the presentation in order to increase the conversation. Uh, I want to thank Dr. John Boone uh, and all of you for listening. Thank you very much.